Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to uh, Freeman Sullivan okay. channel here on Ustream. We're down here at Bradley Manning Plaza getting ready to uh, broadcast uh, the Occupy Forum uh, with Jerry Mander, who will be our speaker this week. Uh, it's a beautiful day down here in San Francisco, as usual. Uh, 60 degrees and a little bit too breezy, but not bad. And uh, I see some people over here that are will be at the live stream or not the live stream good lord the forum so uh give me a second here to get my act together and uh, i'll go over and uh we'll uh see what's happening anyway uh i'll be live streaming uh most of next week first from washington dc and then from Occupy Wall Street in New York. Uh, we will be uh, hosting a program on the Occupy News Network called uh, Trillion Dollar TV. And that'll be discussing, it'll be a roundup, a round table of the day's events that happened on Wall Street protests, Occupy Wall Street first year anniversary. So uh, this thing's out of the way. Uh, click on follow if you'd like to follow my stream. Um, to receive the latest updates. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and the forum hasn't started yet. So I'll move a little closer as soon as the forum starts. Because they have a no smoking policy down here. And I'm I'm like a chimney until I start live streaming for real. So. As usual. Air posting to Facebook. Facebook, get it together, please. My software rarely works right that you're a part of, especially from my phone. Your phone software kind of blows Facebook. That's why I moved, moved, been moving more and more over to Twitter. Uh, this is Freeman Sullivan. Uh, if you'd like to contact me during any time during the stream, uh, you can tweet me at Freeman Sullivan, or you can. Uh, log on to either Twitter or Facebook or Ustream and uh, to chat on the social stream or the chat. Uh, if you chat on the social stream, however, I'm able to view that on my phone. And if you have any questions or any messages of solidarity or any messages to anybody in the audience, well then uh, I'll be happy to pass those along. Really excited about going to New York next week. Got all my preparations in order. Got my medical cannabis patients card renewed today. All the good stuff that it takes to go to the East Coast. So we're looking forward to making everything possible. Make it a good trip. I've got a nice production crew in New York. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff from Global Rev, also as well as the Occupy News Network. And uh, so do look for us and do follow me on Ustream. See Jerry's walked up. Jerry Mander, great author. If you ever read Four Arg Arguments for the Elimination of Television, that was one of his works. Hey, how's it going? They're friendly occupiers. This is the site of the infamous Occupy San Francisco and famous. We were down here for, I don't know, a good, what, three weeks? at the very site. As you can see, no permanent damage. And no bocce ball. I see they took all the sand out. But grass grows, regrows, you know, and all the stink that they made about us destroying this place was patently unfalse, as you can see for yourself. And there's nobody down here using it, as you can see for yourself. So, usually it's just a load of bullshit on behalf of the uh, powers that be that are you know, talk all this trash about Occupy and whatnot. You know, especially when they got a, a restaurant, I think, across the street with the words Wall Street on it. It's all a big load of crap. I don't believe anything you see or hear unless it's live streamed first. <laughs> with that said, I'm almost.
almost done with my cigarette. And I'll move in a little closer to the action. Hey, what's up? Oh yeah, how are you doing? We, yeah, everyone's family. We have all our family. You guys are family. That's her sister? I never met her sister. Are you going to live stream it? Yeah, live streaming right now. Yeah, I try to, try to keep everything on schedule. We're going to be up on Global Rev and we'll be going out because we're the main, we're going to be feature action for the evening. So. Hi, I'm Earl. Clark, nice Clark. to meet you. Uh, how do you live stream? I've always been curious. Uh, if you get an Android or a uh, iPhone, yeah, I download it. the Ustream app and start yourself a channel on Ustream and uh, something you can broadcast to. And you're, all you got to do is press a couple of buttons, and you're up and running. Ah, oh, okay. And, and when you say someone to broadcast to, what? well, you need to have your uh, channel set up okay. on UStream. Okay. And then other than that, you're good to go. Okay. Anybody can live stream. It's democratic technology. I recommend everybody do it or get into it a little bit. Uh, and uh, it's what we're going to be using. Does it eat a lot of your data plan. Yeah, you have to have a pretty much an unlimited data plan. Oh yeah. Okay. I only have uh, two Gs. So. And you have to have a 4G smartphone. Like, uh, that I got, but I'm like, oh, yeah. I but, uh, yeah, you'll go through bandwidth real quick if you're on. I just didn't want to sit in her particularly. I use, uh, I live stream with uh, Metro PCS. Oh, okay. Uh, 71 bucks a month. Oh, well, no, no, it's not. You have to pay extra for unlimited. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes, you do, for unlimited uh, bandwidth. They just have unlimited phone. Text and talk, yeah. I guess we're getting ready to start here because the blanket's not here. Yeah, if you want to sit there, you good. How's it going? What's going on? There you go. Thank you. We got the man with the recording device. There we go. Yeah, we're up on live stream. We'll be up on Global Rev in a little bit. Oh yeah. That's really the only thing that keeps cops in line nowadays. Knowing they can't break your camera and get rid of the evidence. You know, for real. Let's start cracking skulls and pull one of them out. They act right. Oh, not always, but for the most part, yeah. For the most part, it works. They feel they can really get away with it and then go for it. But. Yeah, well, we'll see. I'm going to New York next this week. Really? So we'll see what happens when. We'll see exactly how much leeway I got a press pass now and everything. So. Uh, We'll see how it works in New York. Right. Nice day down here. It was a beautiful day in the bay. Should be fairly comfortable for the talk. Now, usually when I talk, I'm also talking to my audience here. Oh, right. That's the other thing about live stream, you have an audience. Oh, yeah, they're all sitting there watching. They're watching live, yeah. Does it tell you how many? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, by the end of the day, I should have about, usually over a thousand. Uh, I don't know if I am after today. Uh, the phone account, the, the screen account has been deactivated. Uh oh, well, you're going to have to turn it on. Get some money together and get, get yourself signed up with Sprint. Yeah, that I just get a clear spot and operate off the Wi Fi. Yeah, I could do that too. I think that'd be the cheaper option. <laughs> For me. That's the same. For me. Well, no, because uh, they want like everything to come out of the Does anybody want a financial crimes card? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, we're getting set here. 
Gerrymander has showed up, so he's definitely going to be appearing. Nice little crowd. If you're down here by Justin Herman Plaza, Bradley Manning Plaza, uh, come down and join us. Uh, we'll be here till 9 p.m. Uh, dress for the weather. While it's not freezing cold, it does get chilly down here when the sun goes down. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. No rain, no snow, no nothing. It's too hot. It's nice. It's usually too cold here. Let's see if we can get somebody here to talk about upcoming actions here in San Francisco for the first anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. I know we're going to be doing actions centered in and around. 555 California, Bank of America, former Bank of America World Headquarters. Now it's home to all the rest of the scummy Wall Street corporations. Uh, there'll be action starting from 7 in the morning all the way up until 8 o'clock in the evening in and around the financial districts. Uh, please log on to OccupyActionSF.org for more information. If you would like to participate in the San Francisco Occupy Wall Street first anniversary activities. Of course, I'll be in New York for Occupy Wall Street. Uh, we'll be uh, live streaming uh, pretty much on a continuous basis from Saturday and Sunday, Saturday, September 15th, Sunday, October 16th, Monday, October 17th. We'll be live streaming all the demonstrations and, and various activities. And then at 10 p.m., we'll be at, at the studios of Manhattan News Network uh, and cable access. We'll be live streaming that as well. but. We'll also be on cable access if you're in Manhattan, uh, broadcasting uh, Trillion Dollar TV, uh, discussion of the day's Wall Street actions and activities, and we're going to have a town hall and various guests and clips, and hopefully live streamers that are still down on the site at Wall Street. So that promises to be a real exciting program as well, and take a break from football and uh, watch some real life fun and adventure. Check and see if anybody has anything to say. No, not yet. I'll tweet out a little bit more while we're waiting. Let everybody know that we're out here. If you happen to have uh, access to a face account, Facebook account, uh, let them know what my URL is. It's U-S-T-R-E dot A-M slash capital E little H little U capital D or Ustream dot TV slash channel slash Freeman Sullivan and let them know that I'm people on Facebook to let them know that I'm live streaming right now. I'm under uh, the understanding that the Occupy Wall Street, I know that there will be actions in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, Seattle, Portland, uh, Chicago, there'll be some actions, Austin, Texas, uh, Houston, Texas. I don't know if you all have been familiar with the story that's came out today on Russia Today that uh, the agents from the Department of Homeland Security were setting up occupiers to be charged with meaningless felonies and uh, instigating illegal activities on Occupy. Um, this was done by federal agents, and that was leaked, that was uh, uh, reported all day today by Russia Today. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, you want to say yeah, anything out there to the audience about what was going on in Minneapolis? Uh, this, uh, this happened in, uh, earlier this year, and there trying to get uh, some of the occupied people to sell the drugs to the camp in there. And they revealed that like, these federal agents, they weren't Minneapolis agents, they were federal agents. So, uh, and that was, and 
be after this cost of the work that cost it. This will just be the best way to start. You can go look it up. Because democracy now is a real thing. That's true organized crime right there. Yeah, when, the, when you got your... People are supposed to be paid to protect you are actually the ones that are trying to entrap you. So if you're an occupier, you're somebody that's involved in political protest, do not let other people uh, incite you. Yeah, do not let other people incite you to commit illegal actions or do anything to incriminate yourself. First rule of being a protester. So uh, do remember that, no incriminating actions. You know, it sounds like such a duh kind of a thing, yet people do it all the time. Homeland Security just said that, that, that they want to have 35,000 drones by the year 2014 to, uh, uh, for domestic operations. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, we'll just have to learn how to shoot them down. So, you know, right. By then, we should be able to figure out a way to take them out of the sky electronically. Yeah, right? Sure, they can yeah, be jammed. Laser, so. Right? They want to jam our cell phones. Well, we can jam their drones. <laughs> so it's always an escalating war. We never really want to be involved in a war with the powers that be because that's not what we're about. Not what we're about uh, at all. We're about peace and justice. Real, real. So we have to learn how to transcend that that macho warlike attitude and yeah. and we and real revolutions are always won in peace. So, but I think the problem comes when 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 there's an event that puts so much people in to fear. Like an event that that could possibly be probably fied natural. If like there was a big crash that that would affect everyone. You see to open if you want. Everyone we, we would now jump from. Uh, uh, we're getting ready to. Jerry's up here. We're getting ready to present Jerry Mander here. Thank you. No, the blankets or whatever. Occupy Bernal does a lot of good work here in San Francisco. And uh, keeping well, people, yet, you just wait. keeping people in their homes. Uh, I know that I did a live stream of an action uh, where they were at uh, Pacific PNC Bank, and we were able to keep a lady in her home and prevent her from being foreclosed upon. So, never underestimate the value of direct action in uh, your activities and your actions and what you do. Direct action is very, very effective. One only need look at Bradley Manning, who undertook a uh, courageous action, which was totally nonviolent, and was able to change the whole world, and was one of the inspirations for Occupy, and Arab Spring, and the Indignados in Spain. And all it takes is one courageous man to take one nonviolent direct action, and you can change the whole world. That's how you change the world. No random action kind of stuff. And we're getting ready here with uh, Jerry Mann, who's up here preparing his notes. And Jerry Mann is a great anti-authoritarian writer who's written many, many books. Too many, so many that I can't even begin to list the titles. But uh, I do remember one, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television, which I remember reading back in the 80s, and uh, which is a great book about uh, how television, the various devices and mind control, methods of mind control that television uses to keep you, the viewer, which is different than live streaming, because you all are interactive with me, hopefully, and uh, we're trying to present the truth. Oh, yes, and if you want more information about Occupy Bernal, it's Occupy Bernal, B E R N A L dot org, and uh, they have a calendar on their website, and you can follow their activities. I see Ruthie's trying to get the mic going here, and Beth, thanks for Ruthie and Beth for organizing this event. Tireless, tireless uh, volunteers and activists for Occupy here in San Francisco. Hey, how you doing there, Sue Man? Good to see you're up here and watching. Uh, we're gonna get started here in a couple of minutes, so please be patient. little crowd came here to check everything out. 
Uh, so probably somebody's making some use out of the plaza besides us. Oh. Yes, plaza generally here at Bradley Manning. It's generally very, very few people down here are actually using it. So. Sorry for the camera there, folks. Okay, we will start. Everyone's ready. Thank you all for coming. This isn't very comfortable. <laughs> Might be an issue. Welcome. as needed. <laughs> Welcome to the first Occupy Forum in the park. Thanks all for coming. Oh, oh. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We want to bring back the tradition of political discourse in the commons. Yeah. Soapboxing like they used to do in the last century. So we'll begin tonight. The schedule that we're going to follow is our esteemed guest, Jerry Mander will talk for some uh, about 40 to 45 minutes then we'll move to questions and answers and comments and then we'll also we have some questions for people to keep in mind and time permitting we would break up into small groups or since it is kind of a small group have a discussion um, and the questions that we want people to ponder are what are the alternatives that you envision to the current capitalist system? And what are the steps that you believe society needs to take to get there? Both to remove the 1% and the corporations from power and to institute the alternatives. So um, welcome to Jerry Mander. He's been a writer and activist for over 30 years. Um, he's the author of many books. His first book uh, wrote about the ills of television. And since then, most of his books have been on the flaws uh, in the capitalist system, um, mostly from an environmental perspective. Um, the Capitalist Papers, Fatal Flaws of an Obsolete System is his latest book. Alternatives to Economic Globalization, A Better World is Possible and in the absence of the sacred. And some of the themes that Jerry Mander discusses in his book are whether the breakdown of the current system is inevitable, how permanent war and the destruction of democracy are intertwined within corporate, corporate capitalism, and what the economic alternatives are that respect the carrying capacities of the planet. So thank you to Jerry Mander, a warm welcome. This is a first for me to try to talk this way here. I don't know. I have to lean forward. Yeah. <laughs> way up. Should we turn the volume up? Yes, yeah, so please turn it up. I'm going to turn the volume up. Maybe a mic holder would work. Somebody to hold the mic. Please take the mic off. Well, thank you. For, for being here, I'm uh, what talk louder? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got it. You know, I think I'm gonna take this off. Yeah. 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 Does anyone have a scissor? <laughs> yeah, we'll be ready here in just a minute, folks. Yeah, 
Trying to get the mic uh, removed off the stand. It was taped on there pretty good with duct tape. So uh, they're trying to cut it off right now. Just give it a second. Okay, moving forward. <laughs> what kind of pie? Occupy! Okay. All right, well, I'll do the best I can. Um, as, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've, I've, I've worked a lot in economics in my life, mainly anti-globalization movement, anti-corporate globalization movement. And uh, I've hung out a lot with economists, and it was a meeting with economists that really <coughs> got me interested in doing this book, and uh, felt that it would have a purpose to write a book called um, Capitalism Papers, Fatal Flaws of an Obsolete System. Um, this is a meeting we organized in my office to talk about um, capitalism and what we then start to call post-capitalism to try to figure out um, what the problems are of capitalism that are intrinsic to its form. That is to say that are, it's not only about inequity um, and um, it's got other intrinsic characteristics that need to be identified and, and discussed and named. Anyway, we got talking in this group, <coughs> and um, these were these were very well-known economists. I don't know how many of you read economics, but these are some people who've written absolutely blistering critiques of capitalism. But one thing they had in common was they never named, they never used the word capitalism. They always used words like uh, free market fundamentalism or just the system. Um, and it got to a point where one, where at, at some point we were um, ready to start talking about: Do we really want a system called capitalism? Should we really have it? Do we favor it? Do we, or do we really, do we really want to seek an alternative to capitalism? And two of these guys got up, and as I say, I've read, I've read their books cover to cover. They're really, really good, but they never mentioned capitalism. And they stood up at this meeting and they said. If we're really going to talk about the desirable end of capitalism, <coughs> we're, we're going to have to leave the room. And uh, if any statement comes out of this meeting, we you can't use our you can't use our our name for that. I was, I was just really shocked. Everybody asked them, "What's the problem?" And they said, uh, "Well, we don't want to marginalize ourselves. We don't want to we don't want to we don't want to get called communists or socialists or and not taken seriously." I said. You're not taken seriously anyway. So what's what are you talking about? And uh, part of the reason we're not taken seriously is that we don't really identify what we're talking about a lot of the time. I mean, even the Occupy movement tends to talk about uh, inequity or 99 and one, 99 percent, one percent, and so on. What's that about? And then I heard a speech. Um, then I heard a speech by Bill Moyers just two days after that. And. Um, Bill Moyers quoted Socrates, and Socrates was saying, "It's absolutely necessary if you're if you're if you want to talk about a dominant system, or you want to you want to change something that's operating in society, you have to name it. You can't just talk about it in a vague way because people will have no common frame of reference." And so. Um, that's what I decided. You know, that's really that's really right, and and I think it's it's really necessary to not only name it but also give it form. In other words, right now, if I say the word capitalism to people, you all have sort of an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, there may be some people who've studied it in this crowd, but you get you 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 have a picture of it. But it would be hard, I think, for most of us 
including me just two years ago when I started writing this, it would be hard to sort of name the ingredients of the system. The Occupy movement focuses a lot and, and very, very brilliantly on the inequities part and how it turns out, how it favors only the rich and everybody else is left behind. But there are other very important characteristics. So not only, not only are there characteristics, but they're, they're not reformable characteristics. They don't, capitalism has built in qualities that make it do the things it does. And you know, a lot of people talk about greed as really a problem and that the system is really greedy or that the, 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 the problem is all those greedy corporate people trying to make more money, you know, and when you really study the matter, you realize it's not, it's not so much the people who are greedy, because corporations really have a lot of very good people doing very bad things, and um, it's really the structure. If you try to do the right thing inside a corporation, you're often fired, or just kicked out, or not paid attention to. So there are a whole list of intrinsic characteristics of capitalism that really have to be um, deconstructed and uh, looked at. So that was my purpose in doing the book. It was, it was, um, it was to try to write a kind of primer, uh, which would enable people to see the characteristics of the system that causes problems like inequity and causes problems like uh, the death of the planet and um, war, ever, ever, ever expanding military budget and so on. So that was my, that was my goal in writing this book. And um, I, I had previously written a book about television called uh, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. How many people have seen that book? Yeah. Well, this book, it was a series of distinct arguments about the structure of television that reveal the nature of the technology and that it's, it's going to cause certain things in society, no matter who runs it. And um, I decided to, do, to handle this book more, more or less the same way, as a series of seven kind of distinct arguments uh, about intrinsic qualities of the structures of capitalism and, and what they will inevitably produce and how it's uh, very, very difficult to um, ignore any of them because they all have their own separate related uh, outcomes. So the seven, the seven characteristics are, and, and these are sort of the, uh, what I think are the seven primary characteristics of capitalism, is first, a need for never-ending, non-stop, always emphasized growth must grow at all times, no matter what. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll get further into that in a minute, but one of the, one of the basic definitions of capitalism that I, that I really appreciate, I, I'm not a Marxist, by the way, and by the way, I'm not a socialist or a communist either. I, I spent most of my life in business, or half of my life in business, and then I, and then I spent the rest of the other half in activism, reacting from one side and then the other side to the same sort of problem. So I don't, I think a better definition than Marx's definition of capitalism is by Emmanuel Wallerstein. And his definition of capitalism is wealth, seeking more wealth in order to better seek more wealth, in order to better seek more wealth, in order to better seek more wealth, ad infinitum. He says that summarizes the system. It's all about a single function. It's all about wealth seeking wealth. It has no other values. That's the only one. So, but in order to do that, it's got to grow. The system is based on growth, and the system is a kind of Ponzi scheme. In other words, it's like, a, in order for it to expand, it needs investment now to enable it to expand later. And then it gets these profits distributes the profits and then it needs new investment in order to continue expanding and then new investment to continue expanding and um, that expansion circle must never stop 
What we've seen now in the last few years is that it has stopped. It's slowed down a lot. And part of the reason it stopped, or a very, very important part of the reason it stopped, is that it depends upon a constant feeding in of resources. And we are running out of resources because we live on a planet that has limited resources. So that's the first point. I, I'll say more about that. The second point is, going by the Wallerstein definition, is that uh, it's a system that does not have morality. There's no, it, it's an amoral system. It's not necessarily an immoral system. I mean, certain capitalist enterprises may not do as much harm as other ones. Um, but it's an amoral. It operates free of morality. That's not, that has nothing to do with the reason it's there. And I'll, I'll have a lot more to say about that in, in, a, in a minute or two. Um, but that's a very, very important thing to understand about it, is that is that there's no moral fiber in capitalism. It's not part of its operating purpose. And it's even not part of its legal definition, but I'll come back to that. A third, a third uh, element of capitalism, and this is the one you all are engaged in, so I'll probably spend least amount of time on this one, is the, um, is the way it, uh, is the inequities of capitalism, the intrinsic inequities of capitalism and how it produces and concentrates wealth in a very small number of people, and that it inevitably does that, and over time it does it more and more and more and more. Uh, and the corporate structure of capitalism, which is 85 or 90 percent of capitalism operates through a certain system, and it's a corporate system, and it has very specific characteristics that um, determine how the money and operations are distributed in that system. Who, do, who, who are we competing with here? I think Jazzercise. Huh? Jazzercise. The rooftop party. Oh, the rooftop party. Oh, well, we're in trouble. Um, we can hear you just fine. Then the uh, fifth uh, intrinsic characteristic, uh, or the fourth intrinsic characteristic, is the necessity to uh, privatize democracy and that's what we're seeing very very visibly now and that's what your 99 percent one percent is really uh an example of is uh the system really can't function if there is a true democracy operating which uh shares um, the interests of everybody and then um and then uh act, starts acting in everybody and act, acts in everybody's interest it's it it really it, it's very distracting isn't it it's uh, very distracting can hear you fine. Well, I know, but I can't. I can't hear myself thinking too well. Um, but um, huh? is that upstairs? Is that guys upstairs? coming from the roof? And everybody up there on top. That's the YMCA. Oh, it's the YMCA. Y? Yeah. Really? <laughs> they probably got a permit and we don't, right? So. Yeah, we could move. Actually, we're much more interested in you than in that noise. <laughs> I know. I'm really having a hard time thinking, though. So, um, uh, it is distracting. Let me uh, get back to my. No. Well, we could just move. Um, so the privatization of democracy, it's, 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 it's in the interest of capitalists to really control all the rules, all the regulations, everything about the system, and to, and to take over as much of the system as they possibly can. And that's, what's, that's what we see happening right now with gigantic moneyed interests dominating the entire uh, democratic uh, process. And um, you see it all with the these billionaires absolutely running the show everywhere. Um, the fifth characteristic is the privatization of consciousness. That is to say, the control of what people are, are, are see on television, what they hear, what they think about, 
how, how it affects their uh, thinking processes, what they uh, are ingesting in their brains at all times. And uh, that's, of course, the control of media to a very great degree. And um, even the internet, I think, fits in that category because I think, unlike the promise of the internet, the, the tendency of people's use of the internet is to always go to the is go to the part of the internet that already serves what they already believe and they already know. So, for example, when I was a kid, the you know information came in a kind of mixed bag with um, you know you you turn on CBS News and you'd get a little bit of the right and you'd get a little bit of the left. Now most news outlets are either right or left, and if you're if you're right, you only look at Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. And if you're left, you only look, well, there's not many places to look on the left, but you tend to look for what you already believe and know. The sixth characteristic of capitalism is that it favors war, that it's interested in war, that war is an economic strategy. 50% of the US um, uh, operation, operational budget goes to a military. And almost all of that is, is corporate. So it's important to start thinking about war as a sort of, um, it's sort of a Keynesian, military, Keynesian, military Keynesianism. It's a, it's a make work project. It's a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a way to keep the economy function well. If the, if the military, if all of a sudden world peace completely broke out, you'd see a, a, a collapse of the economy way beyond what it already has now. And then the seventh characteristic that's discussed in the book is that, is that it, this, this system does not produce happy people. It's uh, all the studies of the United States that have recently taken place on the question of self-assessment of happiness show that people in the United States, and, and, and the United States is important because the United States is, the, is really the capital, if you can call it that, of of um, laissez-faire capitalism, of capitalism that has no controls on it, that it's the most free capitalism, and that if capitalism was good at producing happiness in people's lives, we'd have a really, really, we'd have self-assessments that were very high. But actually, as it is now, when compared with other countries, people in the United States self-assess their situation very, very low compared to people in the you know, self-assess their happiness level very, very low. So um, even on those grounds, it's not very successful. And of course, statistics like um, uh, infant mortality and obesity and, uh, vi you know, uh, viol violence and uh, childhood education and um, uh, most of the measures by which society is judged in terms of its performance on behalf of people um, are very, very low compared with other countries. So I'll, get, I'll get into those too if I have time. So those are the seven characteristics. That, that's what the book uh, go, goes into in detail. Now normally at this time, I would read a little snippet of the growth section because to the Occupy movement, I think it may be an important uh, thing to talk about. Um, because I, I have followed the Occupy movement very, very closely and been very, very impressed and uh, am extremely supportive of it. And um, we have Occupy people actually working as uh, interns in our office a lot. And uh, so we've gotten to know a lot of people personally very, very well. Um, but I've been a little concerned that the Occupy movement leaves something out of the story and, uh, that, it's, that, and that it's relevant and probably should be emphasized a little more. So, you think you could stand it if I read uh, something from the book and for five minutes? Oh, sure. It's Jerry Mander, the author. <laughs> so for all those people that are viewing, we're on the Occupy News okay. Network. Thanks for mm -hmm. mirroring us. So you're going out to all the occupiers around the country right now, yes. This, uh, this section is called uh, The Missing Link because it's missing from a lot of people's discussions of the of, of economy. It wasn't mentioned one time uh, 
in the Republican convention. I'll get back to that. Day after day, we hear the economy discussed from all sides of the political equation in exactly the same way. Whether it's Obama or Romney or it's Fox News, Fox News or NPR or Bill Clinton or John Boehner or Larry Summers or George Soros or Sean Hannity or Paul Krugman or Alan Greenspan, everybody is trying to figure out just one thing, how to revive and sustain rapid economic growth which is equated with economic recovery and the larger visions of continued economic progress. They argue about some details. Some say tax cuts, others say tax hikes. Some say stimulus, others say austerity. Some say bailouts, others say no bailouts. Some say jobs, others say investments. Some say monetary policies, others say fiscal policy. But everyone is grasping for a magic elixir to revive rapid growth. Because without growth, the mega economic system that has functioned in this form for more than a century will collapse. They all agree on that point. How to build and sell more cars. How to have more new housing starts. How to expand energy supplies. How to increase investment in bank lending. How to increase exports. Most of all, how to increase shopping. This is the case not only in the U.S., but in China, Spain, Chile, Russia, and just about everywhere now. How to get people to spend more money. How to commodify as much life as possible. How to privatize natural resources, especially water, forests, open land, biodiversity. Anything that has a chance to increase profits and increase economic growth. But there's an important missing link in the discussion, ignored by everyone in the, main, in the mainstream debate. Nature. People behave as if our economic system were a self-contained, separate entity residing in its own detached universe, unconnected to realities outside of itself, rather than embodied in a much larger system from which it evolved and can't escape. Nature can't be left out. It's in fact the most important aspect of the entire discussion. Growth is made out of nature, transformed. What we call our economy, is rooted largely in the process of transforming elements of the natural world into the tools of, and commodities of human activity and then betting on the rates that we can continue to do it nonstop forever. To leave the source of it out entirely is suicide. Wherever you're sitting right now, Chris, is meant for people at home reading books. Please look around. Everything in your presence Everything in your presence began as something from nature, mined from the ground. The garments you're wearing, your shoes, the chair you're sitting in, the book, the concrete steps, the bed you sleep in, the car you drive in, all its tires, wires, metal, metals, parts, the phones you use, the walls and floor of your room, its carpet, the lights and the switches, the electric lines on the walls, the metals in your kitchen, all of them were once minerals that were dug up from the earth, then shipped around the world, transformed, assembled, shipped again to a store near you, and sold. Or else they were living beings, trees, plants, animals, fibers, corals, that had their own worldly existence, their own roles in living ecological systems. Even so-called chemicals and synthetics began as natural elements, later rearranged. Is your shirt made of polyester? Polyester is plastic. Plastic is oil. Oil used to be trees, plants, dinosaurs, sunlight. The whole process of finding, recovering, and transforming these mineral elements and energies and beings into commodities is what we call economics. The kind of economy we've come to depend upon, capitalism, was until recently very efficient at delivering these transformations by using profits from previous transformations to do more of the same. Can this process go on forever? When do we run out of resources? Where will the metals and minerals come from to build more and more cars? Where do we throw away the old ones? How many cars can be built and bought? How many roads can cover the landscape? How many houses can be bought and sold? Where will the food come from when the topsoils are overused and destroyed? That's already a situation we face right now. 
How expensive will food become as transport costs zoom? How much carbon can fill the skies? Here's a quote. We imagined ourselves isolated from the sources of our existence, and we invented instead a myth of endless progress. This is from the group called the Dark Mountain Pro Project, in a great organization in, in England. <clears throat> and then I go into all the species and so on that are being destroyed, and how we're running out of resources of, of every kind, and how the system really can't keep going because of that resource completion. Economist Eric Zensi says this, in the standard view, the financial crisis that besets our economy consists solely of humans acting within formalized systems of their own creation, systems that have no connection to a larger world. That's why the standard view cannot fix the problem. It's what happens when an infinite growth economy runs into the limits of a finite world. The financial crisis is the environmental crisis. We can't solve the former until we solve the latter. We'd better recognize this problem soon. Our horizons are not limited. There are boundaries. When we hear political leaders renewing their race toward unlimited exponential growth, we realize they don't know what they're talking about. Selves are lost in an obsolete set of mental frameworks, a 30 centuries long pro pro process to sublate, sublimate the most basic point of all. All of our economic and social activity depends on nature. We are not separate, and we're not in charge. Failing to grasp that fact while promoting economic strategies that remain unconscious of such realities may, be, may prove to be our most fatal flaw. So that's the basis of the first discussion about growth. And then I go into a discussion of capitalism's a Ponzi scheme, which constantly has to feed in more of these same resources I've just described and um, how that can't go on forever and it's already we're already up against it right now that's what it's all about that's why food prices are getting so high because food has become the arable soil is becoming very scarce and therefore all the arable soil in the world that's remaining in the world has become the subject of a mad race for purchase by by giant corporations who buy who are buying up most of the land in Africa now and uh, kicking the native populations and the local populations off the land and then holding them not even growing food on them waiting for their value to increase because as land arable land gets gets more and more rare there's less and less food and their commodity is going to be increased in value it's the most cynical thing you could possibly imagine Okay, well, I can't spend the whole time talking about that. You get the idea. I think that uh, I don't remember, maybe I'm wrong about it, but I haven't seen quoted um, that the Occupy movement gets into that kind of territory because it's, 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 it's very uh, human-centric and, um, and um, equality-centric. I mean, that, that is incredibly valuable and it's achieved tremendous lot. But there's more to say. There's more to say, and there are more causes for the problem than just um, the, the, the shape of corporations, but that has a lot to do with it. How am I doing on time? How much? What have I done? Okay. I'll, I'll go on. I'm going to go through one or two other things. Uh, let me talk about the morality point, the amorality point, because I think it's another unappreciated aspect. I mentioned how most people see the problem as as greed, and yet it's that's it's a little more nuanced than that, and um, it's a it's a little more important to realize that <clears throat> the nature of capitalist structure. How many people saw the movie Avatar? Raise your hand if you saw the Avatar. Okay, there was a scene in that movie that most people don't really notice, but I, I wasn't crazy about the movie. I thought it was pretty good. It was entertaining, and I think it got at some good things, but there's one scene that is great. And <clears throat> let me remind you about it. It's, it's, where the, it's where the big corporation that's gone off to this distant planet, this planet has, is known to have enormous amounts of resources, and resources have already gotten scarce, so this corporation wants to go get, this planet, get the resources from this planet. And so it hovers above this planet, and then they find out something very disturbing, that there are a lot of Indians on this planet. 
and they're living right on top of these resources. And so he sends down his military. He's got a spaceship filled with military. And he sends them down there and tells, them, tells the military to ask the people to leave their land so that we can get at the resources. And, um, the, and the military goes down there and says, I'm sorry, you, you've really got to leave your land because we're going to take all the resources that you're now living on, which they don't use at all because they're living in a completely other way. And they, of course, say no, just like indigenous populations everywhere in the world have always said no when that question is raised, <laughs> or, or most of them do. And um, so they say no. And so then this military guy calls up the guy, in the, in the corporate guy in the spaceship, and he says, they're not going to leave. What should I do? Should I kill them all? And then the, and then the film kind of slows down. And this corporate guy starts to think about that. And, and this, was, this was, I think, where the film really got brilliant. He starts to think about that, and he goes through a mental process. And he says, well, if I, the, the, our, our, our stockholders really won't like it if I kill a bunch of innocent people. They won't like that. But on the other hand, they won't like a bad quarterly port even more than that. So yeah, go kill the people. And, uh, and then it starts a war, which actually turns out better than most wars um, do. But, but I thought that was really good, because what it got at was what I've called in, in, in my books before corporate schizophrenia. It's, corporate schizophrenia means there are human beings working in corporation, and the film went to a little trouble to show this guy was a human being. He didn't like the idea of killing these people. He didn't like that. And he knew his stockholders wouldn't like it. But the primary thing is profit and, and money. And so you've got to follow that because that's what the corporation demands. So you see him struggle with that. He struggle with his internal desire not to do harm and then his need to serve the corporate interest, which is profit. And it's sort of why good people do bad things inside corporations. Another, a, a couple of other examples uh, I use in the, in, the, in the book are, um, well, I should use another example that's very relevant to this spot we're standing in. But um, do you remember the uh, Union Carbide situation in India where they released this terrible chemical and killed thousands of people? And it happened almost at the same time as, a, as the Exxon Valdez oil spill off the coast of Alaska. And in both of those cases, a very remarkable thing happened. In both of those cases, the president or CEO of each of those corporations went on national television and said, I feel terrible about this. This is a terrible thing. They did it about a day after it happened. I feel so bad. I'm going to devote the rest of my life to cleaning up this problem and making, making good for the people who, who are here and, and, and um, solving their economic problem. And, um, I, I, and we're going to clean up the environment and we're going, to, we're going to just spend the rest of our lives working on this. And then a month later, or six weeks later, each of them um, were back on television saying exactly the opposite thing, saying, we're going to fight these lawsuits, we're not going to let them make us pay, uh, we're, we're, we don't think it was our fault, and we're suing back this other company which contributed to the problem, and uh, it was really the far, fault of a drunk captain on one of the ships, and we're suing him and firing him and so on. A whole series of, and, and they fought it from then on. So what happened in, the, what happened in between? What happened in between is that somebody on the board of directors called them up and they said, you can't say that. You can't say that we did that. You can't admit that. The stock has fallen 100 points since you said that, or 200 points. And it's going to fall more unless you start denying that we did that. So, again, it's like the creature. So, the, so these guys had the option of quitting, you know, and then just talking the truth from then on, but they didn't. And they kept fighting it. For, 
the, the Bhopal case is not settled yet. It's 30 years later. And uh, Dexon Valdez is, I think, mostly settled, but it's, it's been an incredibly difficult negotiation. So that's corporate schizophrenia. That's, <coughs> that's, the, that's the system dominating the human. And so when people talk about it's human greed that drives this, uh, it, it is, but it isn't. You know, it's it's more nuanced. It's a more the, you, they they can't they can't do anything else if they're inside. If you're in the machine, you behave like the machine. You're part of the machine. Period. Or I'm going to talk a little bit about one more example because I'm reminded of it while I'm standing right here. I write about it in the book too. <clears throat> it's years ago. I don't know. None of you are probably old enough to remember the battles in the 1960s and 1970s against high-rise development uh, uh, along the waterfront in San Francisco. These, these buildings, huh? <laughs> About the age of yeah. Anyway, I worked on those campaigns. I was, that was in my very active um, ecology period. And I worked with a guy named Alvin Duskin. And we, wrote, we did a whole lot of campaigning and running advertisements. And there was a lot of thousands of people were protesting the construction of these buildings that we're looking at right here, especially that one, especially that, th those buildings over there were built by Rockefeller Industries. And um, we worked very hard on that and we were, we, we didn't win that one. We did win a, a, a few other ones. We got, we got the big developments off Alcatraz Island. That was one victory we had. But, um, but, his, but the story involves a friend of mine, a friend of ours, my wife and I, uh, call, called one, one day and said uh, that she'd really like, her dad is in town and she'd like to bring her dad over and have lunch with us one day with, the, with all the kids and everything like that. We said, great, wonderful, Where, where's your dad live? He lives in Chicago and uh, we only knew her by her married name. We didn't know her by her maiden name. And uh, so um, she, came, she came over and with the children and with her and with her father, who's a delightful, charming man, uh, very kind to the children, told a lot of funny stories and sort of a sweetheart. But then we heard his name, and uh, I may have, I can't remember the story for all the detail. I may have heard it just before they came over. But his name is Jay Richardson Dilworth, and Jay Richardson Dilworth was the president of Rockefeller Industries, of the company that was doing all these buildings. And we were just stunned that there he was in our garden, having having uh, having breakfast with us, and that he was a great guy. He was such a sweetheart. He was really nice to our kids. He brought them sweet little presents and everything. It was really really nice. So uh, we decided, okay, we're not going to say anything. We're, this is this is you know we're doing this for our friend Melissa, and and uh, it's not a, you know we're we're having lunch. But then he turns to. The, the lot next door to our house. This was in um, on Telegraph on uh, Russian Hill here in San Francisco. He turns to the lot next door, which which had a bulldozer in it, and he said, "What's going on over there?" And we said, "Oh, well, they used to be living there uh, a, a couple in their in their 90s actually. Uh, an old Italian couple had the most gorgeous, beautiful vegetable garden right back there next to our our house." And who lived there, who had lived there for 50 years, and who then, the man died one day a couple of months ago, and the woman died a week later. It very often happens like that. And, um, and now the building is being torn down, and they're going to build a 40 story apartment, a 40 unit apartment building next door. And, and this guy says, Oh, how horrible! How could they? How could they do such a thing? Aren't there any rules against that? That's that's so that's so wrong for for this neighborhood. And huh? Mark Darrow. Exactly. So he said, uh, I don't understand how you, how they can get away with that. And I said, Well, listen. Let me tell you. I'm so sorry to bring it up, but do you know that your company is doing this very same thing? except on a very large scale down on the waterfront that we all love in San Francisco. And you're building these giant buildings and everybody's very, very upset about it. There's been these protests about it. And he said, no, I didn't know that. 
And I thought to myself, well, is that, a, is that true or is that a lie, you know? He's the head of this giant company, and maybe he didn't know about it, because if you're, if you're, if you're it's a big enough company to have 50 of these projects all around the world, he's dealing with spreadsheets and, and stuff. Maybe he doesn't know, or he knows about the project, but he doesn't know this protest against it. Could be. So I said, well, anyway, I, t I told him a little bit about it, and he said, well, you know, I really want to know about that. So he gave me his private card, private office, private phone number, private secretary, send me this material direct to me, and I'm going to look at it carefully, and we'll talk about what, how we can fix the problem. Great. Okay, no problem. So in a couple of days, I sent him this package of material, and um, I got a letter back from him within a few days saying, Thanks so much for sending me this material. I'm going to study it very carefully and uh, get, get back to you. Terrific. So I wait a couple more weeks, maybe three weeks, and I don't hear from him. So I write to him again. I say, uh, say, I uh, was wondering how you uh, are relating to this and uh, what, you, what, you know, let's talk. I don't hear from him. Then I wait another three weeks and I don't hear from him. And I write him again and then I don't hear from him. And then I realized, oh, well, you know, I understand this. This is corporate schizophrenia. This is, you know, his first response was about his daughter and being nice to his daughter's friends and, and about the personal aspect of what we were all going through together. And, um, and, and then he goes back to his office and he lives by a different set of rules completely. It's not the same. It's not the same world. It's another world. It's not about friends. It's not about feeling. It's not about... It's not about friendship, it's, it has nothing to do with love, it's, it's, it's only about corporate purpose. So that's, so that's a kind of amorality that's also built into the system, and there's, it's very, very, very hard to separate it. I want to say one more thing about inequity, and um, because I think it's a topic that you all are particularly interested in. I don't know, I haven't been to enough uh, Occupy events to know if you talk about corporate structure a lot. Um, corporate structure is very, very important to talk about. And I'll just say, I'll just be very brief, just by saying that it's important to understand the, the, the nature of corporate structure because most people, most people in the world today are working inside corporate structures. I don't know what percentage of world population, but it's a majority for sure. And in the United States, it's probably 70% or 75% um, are dependent upon corporate structure. So what corporate structure is, it says it is really strict hierarchy. It's a, struct it's a hierarchical structure, and that has great meaning. You get, the, you get the CEOs at the top, and in the United States, the average CEO of a Fortune 500 company, last time I looked, which is about a year ago, um, makes about 635 times more than the office worker or the person on the um, production line, the, the, the um, la labor. So that's a pretty big separation. But there's also people at the top, like the board of directors, and then, of course, the shareholders in the thousands, all of whom share in the proceeds of the corporate activity and um, make decisions about what to do with that money. So basically what they're doing is they're competing with each other, the top executives, the board, and the shareholders, for, for what the division of the money ought to be, what part of it ought to go back into production to, to generate more money for operations, and what part of it should be distributed among the top echelons. Who, who gets what and how much they get. But there's no question of distributing that money at the lower levels. In fact, the opposite thing is going on at the lower levels, which is that the wages there's pressure to reduce wages and and or to destroy uni unions which help which help people maintain wages and 
And also, there's a tremendous um, increase um, lately in workers being replaced by machines. So it's a completely different, it, it, b both ends of the equation are completely looking in opposite directions. There's, there's no, and that's the structure, and, and that's of course at the top of the, of the ladder, but that's your 1%. And at the bottom of the ladder, or the bottom, not the bottom, the rest of the ladder is the 99%. And so that is built in to the structure. Now, if we have time to talk about alternatives, one of the most important aspects to consider is um, the, re the restructuring of corporations. I would say the disempowering of corporations. The corporations can really still exist but they've got to exist under completely other set of rules. Now, um, I want to make a distinction here before I get to alternatives, and I, and I, and I think I've talked already longer than I said I would. It's okay. What time did I start? Okay, well, I'll stop. I'm going to wind it up on alternatives. The, you know, I could talk like this for quite a long time, so um, an hour. I, don't, I don't really want to. Um, but... Um, um, what was I saying? Alternatives. Huh? Alternatives. Alternatives. You know, oh no, it's good. I didn't know that was an important first point I wanted to say about corporations. When you're talking about capitalism, it's really important, I think, or I anyway, make a very big distinction between what we call large scale, global, national, uh, stock market oriented corporations and local businesses, small businesses, people who run the grocery store, people who run the bookstore, such as there are still any, uh, people who are in involved in small local manufacturing for local purposes, community-based <laughs> community business. It's very important to make that distinction because I sometimes get asked by audience when I fail to make it, oh well, um, what about my grandfather? He runs this very, very nice little store and and uh, he's been serving the community for 40 years, and is that a problem? And that is not a problem. That's, that's fine. It's when it gets out of scale <clears throat> so that it's serving interests outside, and it's serving economic interests outside, and it's serving um, visions that are way outside the community, then it gets to be, that, that's, that's, that's the capitalism I think we have to worry about. And in, in many ways, I feel it's wrong to use the same word, even, for the two things. I don't think the person running a grocery store or a bookstore or a small business of some kind, a service business, they're not capitalists. They're not fulfilling that definition of wealth-seeking, more wealth-seeking, more wealth-seeking, more. They're doing a service. They're making a living. It's good. It's not bad. And I think it needs, it needs, a, it needs a completely different uh, definition. Okay. Let me talk quickly about alternatives. First thing to say, the good news is that there are thousands of very, very good organizations now around the world working on new economy strategies. There are hundreds in the United States. I give a bibliography in the book of those. But there are, there's a really a lot of work going on now about alternative uh, economic structures. And, it's, and uh, some of it is, is, I think, very, very interesting. There are very few who, who are designing very, very specific plans, and, but you can see there's developing a, a kind of vision of what kind of economy could be. And so it's going to be good for you all to sit and, and try to think about that. You can sort of see it developing across on the other side of the river. The big problem is how to get across the river. It's really a problem. That's really a problem because the, the, the forces that control the economy still control the economy and they're very intense. So in, in, in my book, I just go through the same exercise these other, these other people do and I try to imagine what the ingredients would be for a more um, egalitarian, for, for, for a better, for a better um, system that would serve human beings and nature as well as um, economic needs. 
So I break my I break my my um, discussion into four overall points, and I'll just I'll quickly mes mention what the overall points are. The first is nature comes first, not last. We're gonna we're gonna have that reality any minute now. People are gonna people are gonna notice. As I said in the Republican convention, the word I saw an analysis of all the words used in the Republican convention. Uh, the New York Times did a very interesting kind of. Uh, count of all the words that were actually spoken at the convention, and the word environment was never mentioned once. <laughs> and the word nature was never mentioned it once. Says it all. <laughs> the Democratic convention wasn't much better. Yeah, about two times. A little bit, a little bit more. The, the, the absence of an awareness of our connection to nature, and the fact that it's nature that is falling apart, and that is in, in, a, in a way leading us to this crisis that we're in, is um, extremely serious, and uh, so we need to we need to contemplate systems which live, which can live uh, within the carrying capacity of the planet. Now, there's a, there's quite a few systems that are called uh, steady state economic systems. I recommend Herman Daly, who's one of the great economic philosophers right now, <coughs> who speaks about steady state economics, which is a system which sets a maximum production level less than the carrying capacity of the planet because if we're, we're living at one and a half times the carrying capacity of the planet right now that will not go on forever so he's talking about taking a 10 percent under the carrying capacity of the planet and designing economies within that framework the problem comes along because there's so much inequity in the world now and if you don't have a growing economy how do you serve all the people who don't have enough right now. That is a problem. And so there's a new term zooming around right now called uh, contraction and convergence. Has any, have any of you heard that term? It's still pretty new. It's been around for a couple of years in international fora. And uh, what that means is it's a, it, it, it's a conception of, of, of an economy declining, contracting to below the carrying capacity of the planet. And then convergence being that there are a whole lot of people with a whole lot more wealth than they really need, and there are a whole lot of people with a whole lot less than they need, and there has to be a redistribution of wealth. That's that's a that's something the system won't like at all. But that's that's a way out of the problem. Huh? I didn't hear you. Contraction and convergence. It's a pretty good, pretty good term. It started in Europe. Uh, and also, I like this new movement now for uh, a UN declaration on the rights of nature, which is really, really growing. I think it's, uh, I think at some point it will be, it will be, um, you know, instituted like the UN Declaration on Human Rights or the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I think that that will serve, that will be very, very useful when that happens. Pachamama. Pachamama Alliance here in San Francisco is one of the leaders of that. Also, Global Exchange. Is working on that. It was for the, the second element of the four is the primacy, the, the primacy of scale. We need to we need to work at a, at a local level rather than a global level. Economies have to be designed for local level. And how many of you know about the transition towns movement? That's a very good movement, and it's a very very good model for how to engage now in working toward um, solutions. Because it's very hard for most of us as individuals, or even for movements like Occupy, to spread itself on this large scale and deal with the global thing. But if we can build from, from local institutions, we'll make some progress. And uh, as I said in the, in the comparison between uh, global corporations and small local businesses, uh, we, need, we need to emphasize the viability of local local economy, local business, uh, and um, community-oriented business activity. <clears throat> the third is um, experiments in structure, in corporate structure. There's a lot of movements now for worker co-op movements, worker-owned corporations. How many of you have heard of the Mondragon movement? In, uh, oh, the, oh, yeah, Mondragon has been very influential among the Occupy crowd, I know that. In fact, there's a great book called Horizontalism, which was written by Marina Citrin, who was one of the 
Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street people. Um, but there's also a lot to be said about the, the absolute need to uh, change corporate structure. Um, I'm going to just read a couple of, I'm not going to read, I'm just going to point out a couple of rules. Here are, the, here are a few of the ideas that are, that are being bandied about right now. That the legal purpose of the corporation, and I say legal purpose, this, is mean, this means legal. If you work in a corporation, especially a publicly held corporation, it's your job to make profit. If you deliberately don't make profit, you can be sued by, by the shareholders, and sometimes are. The legal purpose of the corporation should be to harness private interest to serve the public interest rather than to seek profit. Corporations are not people. Of course, you all know about the Citizens United campaign. That, that has got to be changed. Corporations must engage in true cost accounting. When they do harms and when they do cause effects in nature or in the landscape, it's for them to pay for it, not for, not for the taxpayers to pay for it. Boards of directors and controlling interests of corporations must always include a dominant portion of its membership, more than 50% uh, from workers, community stakeholders, environmentalists, public health officials, local economy people. Every corporation should have a maximum size. There's no real reason why corporations should be free to get bigger and bigger and bigger when it causes greater and greater harm. Limited liability for corporate shareholders and executives has to be banned. If corporation does harm, then people should be liable for it. Communities should initiate site here to sell here policies. All corporations should be, should be local. I heard a very good program today with Richard Wolf on KPFA where he talked about how most of the countries in the world have rules and penalties for corporations who move out of the country. You know, you can't just pick up your corporation and go to China or go to Romania or go anywhere else, you have to pay an enormous um, fee for all the problems that causes. We um, need to encourage worker-owned corporations, non-profits, B-corporations. The ratio of salaries within corporations really needs to have rules made about it. In the case of, the, in the case of Mondragon, the salary ratio instead of 650 to 1 is 3 to 1. And that's uh, very, very good. Corporate profits above a fixed percentage of income should be understood as being inefficient. Corporations should be charged for only one kind of enterprise, not any kind they want. Banks shouldn't be able to buy um, food companies, etc. There's a list of about 30 of these kind of rules. That's a very important part of any change that we're going to take place. And finally, I talk about hybrid economics. It's not for us, there may not be a system out there right now that really exactly answers the need that we're all facing to find a new model. Um, socialism has problems. I don't think that many people in the world today are really interested in, in centralized control of everything, although Centralized planning seems like it's sort of a good idea some of the time, if it's a democratic kind of planning. Uh, I don't think there'd be much interest in communism anymore. Um, but there are a lot of things going on in the world. You have countries like, uh, most, many countries in the world are already hybrid models. You know, you have state capitalism, you have um, all different forms of capitalism. Then there's uh, the Scandinavian model, which is which right now probably is functioning more successfully than any other. But we need to look at, we need to study the world of, of economic systems and sort of pick and choose and see what works and see what doesn't work and be, and get away from definitions about, about what we're doing and construct a hybrid model and think about how to make that happen. Okay, I'll just stop right there. I talked way longer than I ever thought I would. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. That was Jerry Mander, uh, noted anti terror Jerry Dodger. Lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you so, so much. much. That was wonderful and enlightening.
Um, we're now um, lucky enough that uh, Jerry is willing to take questions from us. So um, if you could line up here so you can get to the microphone with your questions. Um, did you want to start off? Or I don't think I need a microphone. How about competition? The role of competition uh, in capitalism? The role of competition. Um, That's a negative. Well, competition can be viewed as a negative in itself. Uh, I, I think building a system based on competition is, is, um, is um, uh, wasteful because it's, it's, I think it would be far better off if, if, if people, I'm not sure, you know, I don't, I haven't had that question before, the no, whole competition, I don't, I don't think I have an answer for that. What's your opinion about it? About it, well, what it does to people, I'm, you know, it's me against you, yeah. but you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going up, mm -hmm. and that means you're going down. Yeah, and the system is, is, based, is based on that Absolutely. principle. Absolutely. That's right, you're right. And if, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Right. Cooperation is, of course, a much better, um, much better aid. human interaction than uh, competition. And, uh, and of course, in, in competition, somebody wins and somebody loses. And that's not necessarily what we're striving for. It, it shouldn't be um, an either-or um, outcome. It should, be, uh, it should be, we're in this as a group, we're in it together, what's going to work? Okay, we'll do. Uh, we'll we'll take questions two ways. We can you can either come up here or you can just raise your hand. So we have this man, then we have Carol, and then we have the man in the back. I'll just give you numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember your number eight. So number one here. Uh, you're interested in the environment and you're interested in a hybrid what about eliminating debt for nature that is by socializing the value of nature that is using market rents but socializing that using that as public revenue eliminate the private or and large corporate interest in exploiting nature in order to gain what's called economic rent which i'm sure you're familiar with that term you want to speak to that um, I, I'm, I'm completely against the, the monetization of nature. It's causing tremendous problems right now all over the world. The big, the big example of I mean, it's it's a it's a way of putting a price on all kinds of uh, natural resources and all kinds of public services and all kinds. It's monetizing all. It's being it's being promoted as the answer to create a green economy. It's to monetize it all, and I think it's ridiculous. It's causing tremendous harm in the forests of the world right now because they're they're monetizing the Amazon, for example. And so they say the Amazon is worth a certain amount of money. So let's let, let, let's not cut it down. Instead, we'll give that money uh, to the Indians and give a discount to the corporations for not cutting not for not cutting down the the forest. It, it's a completely absurd thing. I mean, I think the I think nature has got to be appreciated as nature in itself. And until we do that, we're not going to get anywhere with that whole enterprise. I'll, re I'll refine my question then a bit. The land value underneath San Francisco's buildings is estimated by the Board of Realty here as upwards of $23 billion a year. So that's the nature I'm actually speaking of as much as I'm concerned with the Amazon, which I am. Uh, with Amazon, but there's a great deal of value in the land itself that is not being occupied by the public. That is the rent of the annual rent of the land of San Francisco is not being socialized. And I'd like you to speak to that. To do that would eliminate land speculation right here and address a host of issues. Sure. Uh, in real estate, there's two values. When I, I bought a home, I live in Bernal Heights, and I borrowed $450,000 to buy a piece of real estate. 65% of that is for the land value. 35% is for the structural value of, the, of what's on that. That 65%, the locational value, I argue, is, belongs to the public. I'd like to see a property tax that collected the annual rent of that location, not taxing the building. I mean, I'm, I'm 
absenting that from what I'm speaking of. Does that make? I'm speaking of Henry George. If that's a, that's that's a, to give you a, a short course in that. I, I haven't read enough Henry George. I, I you know, what it makes me think about though is um, if we're speaking about models, you know, new models and so on, is uh, in the book I spent a fair amount of time talking about indigenous peoples' models. And in those models, it's particularly the Iroquois Confederation and their rules. And in, in many of these societies, um, private ownership of any natural resource is um, not allowed. It's not, it's not, it's not okay. And so it's, it becomes impossible to exploit nature on, a, as a, on an individual basis. So to me, it's like, um, I don't, I, I guess I don't, I don't know Henry George, I don't know how to respond to that in specific terms, but for me, I'm, I'm a, a very big admirer of the um, principles that are imbued in the economic structures of most indigenous people, and that includes no private ownership of, of um, no private ownership of public context property, no private ownership of land, no private ownership of resources of any kind. Um, you can own your own house. You build it, it's yours. In other words, you have rights over it, but you can't, you can't own the, um, the collective uh, community. You can't, you can't own the natural world. Thank you. Um, Carol? She said she can shout this. I'll Maybe repeat. Not. I'll repeat your question. That won't work. I rambled too much. Thanks. Anyway, okay. Here's a question for you that you may not be able to answer. <laughs> and if you can't, fine. Uh, the you're so even-handed in the in your presentation, and. You know, you're saying things that are so clear to us in terms of policy. Built into capitalism is the urge to destroy anything that threatens it. This country has been based in capitalism and imperialism and attacking anything that threatens it from the beginning. Do you have any ideas about how to combat that we have seen that in the last year since September 17th in major ways. So. Oh, I, yes. Well, yeah, of course, the country does do that, and <laughs> capitalism does do that. It, it is very, very interested in preventing anyone from being viable in opposition to it. And, um, uh, how to oppose that, I suppose, is to just keep on doing it. Yeah, I really don't know of any, any more effective way of doing it than just keeping on. It's, uh, if I knew how to dismantle it, um, I would uh, I'd immediately write a book about it. But um, I have a, you know, what all these economists are working on now is, is alternative visions and alternative structures and uh, arguing that they're far more viable than what we have now in terms of living up to human needs and the needs of the natural world, and that that is the um, best way of um, combating the dominant system. So I don't know of a better way myself. Well, in European countries, they're way ahead of us. We seem in this country to have a poison pill built into our system. She's saying that in Euro European countries, they're more effective I do think that there is a um, um, greater understanding of corporate power in many, in many European countries, and, um, and there are uh, greater controls uh, in some European countries as well. I do think that. But um, I think that if um, people re revolt against corporations in Europe, eventually they're met with the same kind of resistance they're met with here. Question number three. I think that was this man back here. I just wanted to say that, you know, it appears to me 
that we're on an ev uh, a, a path of evolution in consciousness, awareness is expanding, and we're able to connect the dots now to how we've been ruled and controlled, manipulated, and this veil is being lifted, and we all can see that now, and now we need to take action in how to bring this, this structure that seems to be adversarial to our physical well-being as well as our social and environmental well-being. And uh, I listened to Dr. Michio Kaku from the University of New York, Dr. Eric Pearl about consciousness in the universe, Dr. Dean Radin, Dr. Uh, oh my, my gosh, another doctor, about <laughs> quantum physics and consciousness. Of this is just uh, unveiling of the multi-dimensional capacity of our of our structure and who and what we are, and its potentiality to create, manifest new things. And in uh, in contrast to that, I say that there's a very simplistic methodology that we can use using the research, the understanding that repeat itself over and over how consciousness and quantum physics relates to each other in manipulating reality and that we can use this template of understanding that's very tangible even for a young elementary school to kid to grasp onto and use that to move our our, our movement here to uh, bring about greater understanding and change in the way things are being done before these manipulators start a war with Iran or somebody else and diverge our energies into something else where we're distracting that because it's, it's taking more of our resources and so forth. And this is part of their gameplay in, uh, I would say, uh, Lessening the impact of movement. They have their, uh, okay, thank you. Um, that was very. That was a wonderful comment. Let Let's try and keep them to a minute so everyone gets a turn. But that no, that was beautiful. Um, do you want to comment? Okay, I think you said it all on that. We're We're reaching a higher level of consciousness. Um, question number four. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jerry. That was really uh, enlightening. Uh, <clears throat> my question: You mentioned that the Scandinavian countries, uh, that you know, a version of capitalism is working the best. And uh, George Blakey, as many of us probably know, has written an article, is writing a book about how the 99% nonviolently took power uh, from the 1%. And I'd, I'd like you to just a little bit more about what is really working in Scandinavia and specifically uh, are they doing better in terms of being at peace with the environment? Uh, well I don't want to overstate uh, how well it's working in Scandinavia because it's uh, it's just working better it's working more smoothly um, and there's greater far greater egalitarian uh, levels in Scandinavia and in many many other countries the US is one of the Worst, it's the it's the it's the, the least egalitarian of of any uh, highly developed industrial nation right now. But Scandinavia has worked out a kind of combination between between uh, capitalism and socialism uh, that has a lot of nuance in it. And but they they have their oligarchs also who uh, tend to dominate the economy. And it's it's by no means a perfect system. But but they give privacy to human welfare. They have, um, you know, um, holidays for, for you know, the work, the, the work, the minimum wage is much better, the health care is much better, the, the, the holidays for pregnant women are much better, the, the, all, all, of the, all of the social laws that we're, that we're having a very hard time even keeping from privatizing are much more functional in Scandinavia than they than they are here, and um, we could do a lot. On the other hand, they have a lot of racism in Scandinavia, and the, there's uh, 
it is no, it's, it's not, it's, it's by no means perfect. But I'm saying, in terms of hybrid economics, they're they're doing some things a little bit uh, better than anybody else. And, and in terms of the welfare of the society of the people, um, they are serving human interests a lot better than we are, for sure. Because they have a high degree of, of, of social uh, consciousness uh, operating in government, right? and they have rules against um, the, the very, very high tax rate for wealthy people, for example. There's a much greater equality of wealth there, and there's much greater control of corporate behavior, way, way more control of corporate behavior than there is here. And uh, there's a lot of rules about wealth. I, I, I don't know, I guess there's more of, of a tradition of that there than there is here. I don't know how it evolved into that, particularly in those places. Question number five. Number five, go to one. Uh-oh, we're going to have ready to go. Yep, here. Sorry, folks. Yeah. So working on that, folks. So glad you could join us here. I feel like I feel like what's happening is capitalism has been hijacked, and I feel like if you look at the structure of currency, those that get the currency force or, or get the currency first get to trade with the first. You know, how do we talk about true capitalism if some guys online? trading, you know, and, and what, do what, just made two or three hundred thousand dollars. At some point, no good or no service would put back into the economy. So I feel like it's more or less a currency problem that if those that get the currency for first get to use it for their own power, and then we're now left stuck to have to work with a currency that's going down in um, and man value. And I also believe in um, freedom and I think that if there was a big crash which which I think is going to happen they will try to, try to blame it on capitalism to try to info, to, to try to impose some other so, so, solution to the problem that 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 has been artificially created I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, um, if you're saying that um, that the, the, that capital doesn't get circulated when it goes into private hands, I think I heard you say that, and therefore it doesn't benefit uh, other people. That's that I, I certainly agree with that, and that's in the nature of capitalism that it does that. But it, but it, I think you're also saying that you feel that like capitalism would be our solution in the long run. Are you saying that too? Well, right, but so the the problem is the control of, of of currency and of money, and I agree with you completely. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, the, the the way most uh, progressive societies would deal with that is by taxing it at a much higher rate than uh, that's certainly the way Scandinavia, for example, deals with that. Is uh, is that when the money enters con the con in enters into the control of the capitalists? A way of dealing with that is by high, much higher levels of taxes, which then redistributes it among people who then share the benefits. It's a way of, of socializing um, profits, and uh, I, I'm all well for that. Question seven, right? Six. 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 Thanks, Jerry, for your presentation. Um, it is true, it seems recently, that more and more people are questioning capitalism, which is a good thing. And we, a lot of people didn't do that before. Um, but um, 
I grew up with the idea, and I'm sure many others did, that um, indigenous people were primitive and Western culture was civilized. Well, it's become more and more obvious that just <coughs> the opposite is true. <coughs> I don't know if you know much about the Hopi prophecies. I know you wrote a book called In the Absence of the Sacred the Malice. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> also, I've I'm, I'm been part of the Occupy movement, and I am optimistic. Um, but I, I'm not, I really question whether we can change fast enough to save ourselves. So it's kind of it's kind of a sad state of affairs when you wish for economic collapse or an environmental catastrophe. But I think that's what it's going to take to wake people up, uh, and people are going to suffer, but a lot less so than if this if this continues and, and we all die, which is where we're headed. So it seems like in in a crisis, people wake up and. Uh, I hate to say it, but I am hoping for economic collapse, an environmental catastrophe, to save we have left. most of the people yeah, and the species. Any drop of the GMT is. I don't know how you feel about that. Another acre of the rainforest saved. Well, I'm not really in favor of a giant collapse, to tell you the truth. I think, uh, I think, I, I think, uh, I think, it, I think it's a very good chance that it's coming, and I think that. Um, if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a sudden collapse of the entire economy, you're going to get a lot of violence that is going to go wrong. You know, so the visions of the apocalypse hurt. are going to really start to take over. I don't think that's... I, th I think we really have to work toward... We have to do everything we can. You know, there's only so much we can do, but whatever we can do, we should do to try to avoid that, in my opinion, and to just keep hoping that... Um, we can um, envision structures and behaviors and new societies that will enable us to cross that river and move from here to there. It's a, it's maybe a long shot, but um, it's a long shot. If, if we let it all collapse, it's going to be a long shot to anything good too. So uh, I just think um, if you, it's not even useful to think about collapse because I just wake up every day. I'm totally aware of the possibility of collapse. But I just wake up every day and do what I do and try to do what I can and hope for the best. And I think that's basically what we're what we're able to do. And um, that may not be a satisfactory answer because it, there's no real formula uh, about that. Oh, I, I, I couldn't talk, really talk about the Hopi process. I, I do know a lot about I do know a lot about um, the Iroquois. And uh, I've discovered more and more about them lately. Uh, how many people are aware that the Iroquois were a model for the U.S. Constitution originally? Uh, you know, their their system of governance was the U.S. system of governance is a, is a wildly distorted version of the Iroquois model. In other words, the Iroquois had two two legislatures which had to agree. My it's camera, very buddy. much like the the two houses of the of the United States uh, uh, system, except the United States left out women, number one, which the Iroquois had, and the United States put a president on, a ruler on top of it all. So, But the uh, indigenous uh, formulations have a lot to teach all of us. Question number seven. Um, when it comes to a viable solution, uh, there's a gentleman named Jack Fresco, who's actually done a lot of work on this already. Uh, he started a project called the Venus Project, but uh, you know you can always argue uh, if, his, if his solutions are good or not. But what he points out is we've already kind of done this with FDR. Uh, FDR had something called the New Deal. He had the Marshall Plan. He had the, uh, the GI Bill and Social Security, um, which then built the largest middle class in world history, from what I understand. And you can take what FDR did and use that model with building. I mean, you pointed out this issue about we need to do it locally, which I don't think we need it. I don't, if people start doing it locally, they're gonna get left behind by the crash that is inevitable. Uh, what really needs to be done is a massive infrastructure based off of uh, geothermal, wind and solar. And FDR already did this uh, with you know, how large of a project it was. You already gave a, a model of how to do this already. 
Yeah, no, it was FDR. Yeah, he's the one that did the New Deal and stuff like that. So, correct. It was a massive project, and then it produced the largest middle class ever. But we needed the, the problem was he didn't solve the, the scarcity problem, and that's going to be solved with the technologies that have been, you know, around now that we can actually use to do it. So you should check out Jack Fresco with the Venus Project. Really good guy. Okay. Um, comment. Uh, you know, there was a very good interview with Richard Wolf today on radio. It's the same one I mentioned earlier, where he talked about Roosevelt's response to the Depression versus um, the Republican and Democratic response to it, and uh, how, God forbid, you should do public spending of the kind that uh, Roosevelt did um, to pull us out of the Depression. And I think it was very, very brilliant and very wonderful what he did. However, the way we got out of the Depression was the Second World War. Correct. That's the problem. But the, <laughs> thing, the, the internet, the consciousness, is talking about. The Second World War was the uh, Keynesian solution right. to uh, uh, depression. But you can do and it. I think we're trying to do that now. Paul Kruger talks about how you fake an alien invasion and we would do it. <laughs> so, but the, the internet, the way that the internet is becoming a global consciousness, you're going to see this. We have question number eight, and then our esteemed speaker has to leave. Unfortunately, we can continue this discussion um, if people aren't too cold. Question number eight. Eight. Uh, thanks, Gary. So uh, I'm not going to be here. Thank you, though. I read the four minutes of television. Actually, right when I moved to San Francisco, I gave up my TV for five years to that. So uh, <laughs> I, I've followed your work for a long time. Uh, you know, there are other people that are working on some of those alternatives in, in the Occupy movement here, and also specifically in San Francisco. Some of the uh, of our Occupy members, because I'm a member of Occupy as well, uh, are working on a project in it. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about your opinion on um, working within the confines of the system as uh, the, the prospect of a community development financial institution, uh, a credit union, uh, where you actually uh, have, you work with uh, co-op development, uh, micro enterprise like Grameen Bank, uh, you work with uh, groups like Valley, and you do some of the other things 